but uh, but your history in Nashville is wow. I mean, not only did you start big in L.A., but you got into Nashville and the songwriting scene, and you were playing a lot. So what? How did that transition that transition actually happen for you? As far as transitioning, you know, I I've, I've been very fortunate that my day gig is a studio musician. And I've been fortunate to be in the studio with, you know, most of the big stars. And the tricky thing is that it's like a cocoon when you're in the studio. The outside world is not allowed in. You're kind of one of the privileged few. And you don't want to whip out a song in the middle of all that because you've been allowed in to make music. And once you, you say, hey, I got a song for you, you're taking a big chance of becoming... Like, oh, we don't want this guy because he's selling and we hired him to do this other thing. And I found out very quickly that people would have a different reaction if I if I did have a song. I remember uh, when I first started in Nashville, I played on a Waylon Jennings record and I went, uh, Mr. Jennings, you know, I have a song. And he went, oh, great, let me hear it. And we recorded it and it was a, a hit. So I thought I... You know, I thought I had it figured out. So then I'm playing on a George Strait record. I go, hey, George, I got a song. And he looked at me like I had violated the the code. You know, yeah. it's like you're selling me on our recording session. So I learned really quickly that you have to be very careful and do the job that you were brought there to do, which is to play on their records. Time, I had some artists. I'd be sitting there playing the piano. And I go, that's kind of cool. Would you write a song with me? which is, is an unfair advantage, obviously. Sure. But I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, that happened with Naomi Judd and Vince Gill. You know, they, oh, sweet. they uh, said, let's try to write something. And in the case of Vince Gill, uh, we, we had an appointment, and it was like on a Sunday morning, and he'd forgotten about it. And his wife had made some sort of plans for the day. And... He, he wanted to honor the appointment, but he shows up at my house in a really bad mood. Yeah. And I'm like, uh-oh. And he said, ah, I, mean, I promised my wife, but I want to write this song. And I went, well, you know, we don't have to do it. And he said, no, it's okay. It's just that everybody wants a little piece of my time. And I went, okay, well, why don't we write that? Yeah. <laughs> Which is the opening <laughs> line that I still believe in you. Yeah. And I already had some music. And so I started singing, you know, everybody wants a little piece of my time. I said, what if it went on like this for a while? And then I said, and then it's got to go up high up to that Vince Skill place that I can't sing. And he goes, yeah. oh, you mean like you fall in like rain? And I went, thank you very much. You know, <laughs> let me call the college and tell them that, yes, my kids are going to be going to college. You know? <laughs> and uh, so we knocked it out. And it's like when you have a singer of that caliber who can take – the idea you have in your head, and as soon as they sing it, you know it. It sounds like a great record. Yeah. So that was probably my most uh, memorable experience co-writing was to, awesome. when he opened his mouth and started singing. And that's one thing when you write, because I'm not a singer, you have to write for great singers. If you write for yourself and you're not a good singer, then why would a great singer ever want to record your song? I agree. So you hear it in your head, but there's nothing like having him right there singing. And it's yeah. like, okay, here, here's the phone book. Sing some more and we'll, we'll, we'll make a hit record. So it was, it was kind of unfair almost, but, uh, you know, and I think the last time I saw you, we were touring with Vince Gill and you were. never got tired of him performing that song. And oh. as soon as people realized what it was, they start clapping and it's yep. like, never got old. Never got old. I can't never imagine, to, especially in that scenario, you know, being out there on the road with him, playing keys, and then to get to see that response night after night from people over something that you co-wrote with him. You know, that's, those are, that's our babies. You know, our songs are, that's, that's an extension of us that goes out there into the world. And for, for them to draw that sort of positive attention, you know, that's, it thrills me and it humbles me all at the same time. Well, what's weird about that particular song, and I don't know why this is, 
that if you're familiar with the song at all, mm -hmm. uh, it gets to the chorus. You know, there's there's some clapping at the beginning, like oh, I know what this is. Yeah. Then he'll sing the chorus, and when he's finished with the chorus, everybody claps after. A chorus. I don't know why, but they <laughs> always do. And I'd always look over at the bass player, which is Glenn Wharf, yeah. and I'd look at him like, and he'd go, "That's right." Every single night, they would mm -hmm. clap at the end of the first chorus. I don't know why, but probably because his amazing vocal. But I always got a kick out of that, you know. And if they didn't, I thought, you know, huh, who are these people? Yeah. <laughs> but it just seemed like for some unknown reason, every concert, people clapped at the end of the first chorus, which wow. was really fun for me. That's